All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is David Kaplan. And uh, probably like most of you, I have lived through the last seven plus years of CPU side channel fun. And we have, what, like 15 different CPU side channel mitigations now in bugs.c. Uh, I would opine that there are very few people in the world that understand how to configure these correctly, especially outside of this room. And that's what I'm hoping we can improve. Uh, you know, and, and so the approach that I'm proposing here, and there's an RFC series that went out late last week, is to add some new controls based around attack vectors. And attack vectors are things like a user process attacking the kernel, so that's user kernel, you know, a process to process, uh, a guest VM to the host, guest to guest, or a cross thread for the SMT scenarios. And the hope is that these would be easier to use because attack vectors are really a property of how the system is being used, uh, such as are you running untrusted VMs on your system? And so the, the theory is that you, a system administrator knows how their system is being used, could make a decision about essentially what the threat model is, which attack vectors they care about, and then the kernel will configure the mitigations appropriately for them. And that would have the advantage, first off, of potentially disabling mitigations that they don't need based on the chosen attack vectors, and also uh, hopefully giving them protection over time because attack vectors are really a property of how the system is being used, which is likely somewhat static. Uh, while mitigations get added frequently as uh, new research is found and there's new updates, and so this would give them protection going forward from the issues that they need to care about as well as disabling the ones that they don't need to care about that happen to get added as part of an upgrade. So, that's the, the proposal that went out here. Now, uh, the patches, as they currently stand, they do not change any of the defaults. So the, the defaults for these remain how the kernel currently exists. The individual bug controls will override the attack vector controls in either direction. So you can enable an attack vector but turn off a mitigation you don't care about if you really know what you're doing. Or similarly, you can disable a vector, turn on a mitigation if you want. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much what there is to it. So uh, I, um, I'm looking forward to some, some discussion about this. Uh, specifically, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know, is this of interest, right? Is this the right way to think about this problem? Uh, is there a different way that we should think about this? Are these the right attack vectors that we should be looking at? And uh, then also, if I missed anything in the table here uh, that someone can point out a problem, that would certainly be welcome as well. Yeah. So question, so for this one, so like how does it, um, with confidential computing, confidential VMs, so when you say here guest to guest, does it apply to all types of guests and things like that? So is there differences that would be between? Uh, right now, no, there's, there's nothing different with uh, confidential VMs. These would be mitigations that KVM would enable to prevent guest-to-guest -guest attacks like IBPB in between guests. Um, confidential guests do need separate mitigations typically, but you can't really rely on the host to do those. So presumably the architecture like SEV or TDX would handle that. Yeah, th th this is just what KVM would do. Yeah. So I am still a little um, confused about what you mean with user to kernel versus user to user and guest to host versus guest to guest, which is basically this, you know, the same thing. Um, but you know, what, I, the, it's not at all clear what, what, this, what the distinction you're making is, at least from looking at the slide. Okay, so it, it's a good question. I thought this might come up. So the, the <laughs> I actually only have one slide. I, I want to make sure I got through them. Uh, <laughs> so so, so the, the user to kernel attacks are the ones where you are, um, of course, trying to exploit something in the kernel, whereas the user to user attacks, you're trying to exploit something in the target process. So if you think about like a Spectre v2 sort of thing, user to user protection means IBPB to flush the branch predictor on the context switch, whereas 
on use it or kernel, you might be using IBRS, for, for instance. Now, there, there is a good question, though, which I do want to address about why these are separate. Because in reality, if you care about protecting another user's, uh, another process's information, you really have to protect both, because if you can get to the direct map, then you get it all. Uh, and the argument that I have, which is open to debate, certainly, is that the kernel code and hardening techniques may evolve over time. And consequently, the risk of like, user to kernel or guest to host attacks is somewhat of a property of how the kernel is built and what hardening features it exists. And so whereas when you're talking about user to user attacks, you have no control or no expectation of what is in another user process. And so that was my argument for separating those. But let me know what you think. And it, it's, it's worth saying specifically that uh, a whole bunch of research has come out recently and less recently um, looking specifically at leaving poison in the predictors across a context switch in the kernel and then attacking the next piece of user space. So Pathfinder uh, is an example of a recent paper that did that using um, details in the conditional predictor, which we've got no controls to flush at all. And that, um, I believe, managed to pull JPEG images back out of the conditional predictor uh, with, with enough analysis. So uh, there, there's certainly a lot of people concerned in the user-to-user -user case, even if you trust the kernel. In the back. So first of all, thanks for doing that. I try to mitigate some of those problems in production. And the levers we have right now are super hard. And that's going to help. And I'm wondering if we should go one step further and focus on the mitigation itself instead of what it mitigates. For instance, do I want to enable IBRS at entry and exit? Or do I want to enable STI, and B, uh, STI BP? Things like that that we have better control instead of like what we are mitigating. Because if we focus from like what the kernel is doing exactly, like what is being mitigated is just, is just a consequence. Because a lot of those vulnerabilities are kind of mitigated by the same mechanism. And some, somehow I have the impression that the way we start thinking about those mitigations came from an era where like, oh, we need to fix this as soon as possible. But that's been here for like, what, six years now? And we're still finding the same problems. And we are st still behaving like with the same mindset. Like, oh, I want to mitigate this. I want to mitigate that. Start, instead of thinking like, oh, this is a new feature that we have now on the micro, on the micro code. I, do I want to enable that or not? And we can make like spec v2 mitigate. Depends on this, this, this being enabled. That'll well, be fine. But we, I think we're still thinking the other way around. I hear you saying, I, I will respectfully disagree, though, for, for two reasons. One is that I, I think it's, it, it's hard to make sense, unless you're an expert in the space, about what does STIBP get you, just from turning it on. But the bigger thing is that, for better or worse, I think much of the outside security community is still in this mindset of, there's a CVE, I apply a fix. Right? And so that's why we have to have that, here's a you know, Spectre V2, here's the fix. Yeah, I, I was going to say very quickly before I pass it on, is everyone aware that STIBP is different between Intel and AMD, and you, the way you need to drive it is different, and currently no code does it like that, because we only found out a year after the fact? It is it's super simple. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, as a distro kernel maintainer with a lot of end users, I would guess that probably the large majority of, of my users have no idea what any of those mitigations are. So if we, yeah, we turn them on by default, or a lot of them on by default, but if we give some control like this, uh, I, I really like this. I think it, it's something that end users, I mean, not sysadmins, not engineers, end users of desktop systems can look at this and say, oh, well, this makes more sense to me. Thanks. That's good to know. Um, so the, the, I wanted to give the Google perspective on this because we really like turning mitigations off. Google has a strong desire for that. Um, and we've hacked our kernels to give us ways to turn them off in certain cases. Um, but I don't think 
Like, I'm not opposed to this because, like you said, I envisage futures where they become useful, but I don't think any of the boundaries that we want to like stop mitigating align with any of the things on this slide. Um, so the things that Pawan had on his slide about um, like saying this C group is trusted because you can already read the kernel cake or, or whatever. I don't know if we have that in Google, but like, yeah, so, um, so, that's so, so interesting. Right, so first of all, this is definitely not an either or. We right, can yeah, definitely yeah. do both. Um, also, with all due respect, you're probably not my target audience. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but 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 yes. I and I I'm looking forward to the, to the rest of his talk too because these are still very coarse, and I don't think I, I think we are going to want finer grained things. But at least this is something. Yeah, I agree, and I I think it's really valuable. I. Um would almost say just having the table is as valuable as making these these uh, configurations. I would s say, and you know, maybe we could uh, talk afterwards about this, but yeah, I would say there should be 40 rows in there, like you know, L1 does and Snoopy, or I don't know if Zenlead is is included or branch type confusion. There's oh oh sorry. Well, it's worth saying Zenlead's not a speculative thing; it's an architectural bug. Right. Oh. Zenlead uh, is unlike everything else here. Yeah, Great. And, and branch um, type confusion goes by rep lead in the kernel, so. That's why. Fair enough. There. Okay, so we, maybe it's breaking out the AKAs, you know, saying what all the other names are for these, and then perhaps we could talk about why some of them aren't in this category, and what you know, what's the other table for those. Just having that documented would be huge. I think the closest we have to that today in the community is well, you know, there's the parameter documentation in the kernel, and then like the Spectre meltdown checker shell script. But I, I think getting something more comprehensive is going to be super valuable. to a lot of those vulnerabilities. So if you were thinking about vulnerability, as, as you said, like we need to have like maybe 40. I think Wikipedia says around 40. Kernel documentation says what, 10, 12? Because th there is like, we're seeing this from two different perspectives. One thing, and even if we look at the kernel configuration, like you mix like mitigations with things that mitigate problem. Like I want to have Spectre V2 mitigate. At the same time, you have to have Red Pauline. So I think there is a confusion here. What if we're addressing mitigate uh, vulnerabilities, or if we are providing levers that will help prevent a bunch of mitigations? I think it's important to fix that, and this is in the right direction. I think it's worth saying uh, GDS is missing a cross-thread uh, mark on it, which was something I noticed. So I, I think I built this off the kernel, so we might want to check. Bugs.c. <laughs> that, that would involve going and reading bugs.c. I'll follow up on that. Um, I don't think I do agree with the idea of mitigate, like configuring mitigations instead of bugs, but one point in favor of it is that we have mitigations today that we probably have some mitigations today that mitigate a bug we don't know about, and we might have users that, for that reason, might want to turn it on. Um, I don't think I would do that, but I, maybe people would like. So I don't think it's possible right now, if the kernel doesn't think that your CPU is vulnerable to anything that's mitigated by it, I don't think it's possible to say IBPB every time you exit the VM. And that might be something that people want. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I do think, like, I, I, we would never, I, maybe, okay, I don't want to say never. It would be nice. <laughs> um, it would be nice not to have to do new command lines for every issue that shows up and have, uh, have, a, have a command line option for every one of these. It would be nice if in the future, we could just rely on these, but you do make a good point that we probably won't ever be able to get rid of the as mitigation based stuff. As a developer of this nonsense, um, <laughs> <laughs> having all the individual knobs and toggles is really useful while developing and afterwards for testing, which is why a number of them also have a force so that I can force enable the mitigation and look at the end result in my kernel image to see whether or not the stuff is applied, even if I'm working on a chip that is not actually affected by the issue, um, or in a QMU image or what have you that you are poking on at you. So all the individual things and knobs is, is useful for me. The same thing as well. Um, the number of times we've broken XPTI on newer hardware that isn't vulnerable to meltdown how, from a development point of view, both test, testing new stuff and testing interactions or combinations, because most of it is low-level assembly, it, hidden in alternatives with things out of line, and 
and there is no subject. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, and, and, and since we're getting a little bit off the initial subject, which is fine, um, I do want to mention that, of course, the bug controls override these, so you could still do, you know, something like equals force. Also, include in the patch series for anyone who cares, um, I also try to clean up bugs.c a little bit um, and restructure it so that it's more consistent between the different mitigations on how they're handled. And I think if we wanted to in, enforce some you know, commonality, so like everything has a force option, you know, that would certainly be welcome. I don't know how valuable that is now because these things are older, but it's something to consider. So I definitely see the value in here. I have one question. Is the plan, if you say I mitigate user to kernel, whatever, to on to have like full mitigations enabled? Because some of the defaults, like for L1TF, it's like unconditional. It's not unconditional anymore from the flushes. So yeah, there are so some cases where you can still exploit it. So, so, so currently, the way it works is, is I'm just going with the default mitigation setting. But there are, there's one mitigation here in particular, BHI, that actually separates the mitigation between like syscall and VM exit. And depending on which attack vector is enabled, it will enable one or both of those. I think there's some other ones on this list that could be implemented the same way, given that there is now a better way to control the different ones. And so it's not quite fair to say that it's mitigated if this vector is selected, because it may be different mitigations for the different vectors. But I think it's probably fair to say that these are kind of the equivalent of, like this would say, turn it into auto mode in most of these cases. Correct. Yeah. But I think if you stick with the defaults, it gives a false sense of security in some parts. I, I think because that would be a user problem would for that mitigation. That if, if the auto mitigation is not safe, I, I think that needs to be fixed. OK. And I think for L1TF, you want to have a check mark for user to kernel because it's fixed by default. Because the PFN is overwritten when it's paged out, for instance. You're saying L1, you're saying you need the L1TF like, like for user to kernel? Like Shadow OS is basically L1TF. Well, there isn't, I mean, there isn't a mitigation. Yeah, it's, but it's fixed in a way. Well, yeah, tell me, hopefully I'm not wrong here, but I actually think the defaults in general are actually quite sensible. And, and most of the time I would say the defaults that I've seen picked from, from kernel development are usually not the super performance impacting version. They're usually a pretty safe kind of reasonable place to be. Maybe you also want to turn off hyper-threading, maybe get ensure it's unconditional with like L1TF. But it makes me wonder what use cases there are. Like to me, it seems like perhaps there's only one mode, which is like I want the default stuff, which you get today without having to worry about the parameters because the default one will get applied. Or I'm sort of going into beast mode and I'm going to pick what they are myself. So maybe you've seen it would be interesting to hear like who, who is it that's like, well, I, you know, I would prefer to have maybe more of the mitigations off because it, it noticeably impacts my performance and I, I don't need them because of my use case. But they that person also doesn't want to have to configure each one individually because it seems like they might already be in that realm if they know that. If you're that deep into the granularity of your mitigations, you know pretty much what you're doing, so you get the knobs we have. Well, the default settings can be quite costly especially on some CPUs. Some of these are, are pretty expensive, especially in some use cases. And uh, I think many people that I've talked to don't know to turn them off because they don't understand what these things are and when they're relevant. And so the hope is that this is an easier way of saying that like, if you don't run untrusted guess, you don't have to worry about these. And they don't have to go and read the paper about how the bug works. and. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, fair. I mean, uh, rep lead on, on Skylake is maybe a good example of where it really gets terrible uh, to do IBRS. Um, when, but, but that kind of only shows up if you're running guests too. So uh, it, are, are there others where it's like the, it, it is so impactful and they're not doing virtualization? I, I guess I'm sure I'm sure they're out there. Yeah, it, it well, would just be. Th th there are oh. some examples, but then also some of this is to be future looking. So we can uh, do a break now, or we can continue talking in the break. What do you guys want? The break. Break. Okay. Uh, right. So seven minutes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.